So my story begins on October 6, 1990, on a cold, dreary, rainy day at the Moscow Sheremetyevo Airport. I'm moving from the Soviet Union to America. Now you guys know how old I am. <laughs> the 4,700 miles that separate Moscow from New York are nothing compared to the cosmic leap I'm about to make from a country where I have to stay in line for three hours just to buy bananas, where success of any kind is more likely to land you in prison than on the Forbes list, to the land of possibilities. My entire family came to see me off. Big dreams and even bigger worries in our minds. Do you think she'll make it? How many college credits do you think can transfer? How am I going to learn how to drive? And all of a sudden, through all this clutter and confusion, my grandmother's voice breaks through. Do you think you can actually learn English? <laughs> and as only a grandmother can do, with this one simple question, she made it blindingly obvious that I was completely clueless and completely unprepared to face what it would really take to make it and my next steps. I wasn't even asking myself the right questions. So what does it really take to succeed? As an immigrant, figuring out that question is a life necessity. And over time, it turned into a professional fascination, one that brought me to my current role as a CEO advisor at GH Snort. World's leading CEOs come to us to help them gain an edge and boards come to get our advice on who should run the company and how to groom their next CEO. And over time, we kept noticing something really strange and really disturbing. Even the most accomplished leaders, they too kept making the wrong assumptions about what it takes to lead. Back at 19, I was completely clueless about America and what it takes to make it here. But here were my clients. They were experienced and savvy leaders with a lot of experience, and yet, Often they too fell for the wrong questions. Here are just a few real examples. Boy, do you think that he really can inspire the troops? He's such an introvert. Oh, gosh, we could never send her to Latin America. As a woman, she would get eaten alive. Boy, she's such an effective executive. It's too bad. Her accent is so strong. We just really can't picture her representing the company in Washington. How is it possible that leaders who should know better and who often think they do know better. Even they fall for the wrong things when it comes to deciding who's got the right stuff to lead. Well, in our culture, picture of a perfect leader often does look something like this. Six foot tall, charismatic extrovert with a degree and an honors degree from an Ivy League university with an unblemished track record full of accolades and marquee company names. Sounds familiar? Well, the challenge is that even those who every bit look the part don't always deliver results. Here's a crazy statistic. Large companies, when they select the next CEO, 80% of the time will pick an insider. So it's somebody that the board and the, and the leadership team have known for decades. So you'd think in those cases, the board knows exactly what they're looking for and they should know exactly what they're getting. Yet, every year, shareholders globally lose $112 billion because the wrong CEOs get picked to lead companies. What the heck is $112 billion? Well, I'll tell you. $112 billion is enough money to gift $50,000 checks to every person who will graduate from college this year in America. Picture that kind of money being wasted every year after year. Picking the wrong CEOs because we fall for what looks good versus what delivers results is a big problem. But I see an even bigger problem. Who is missing from the picture of the perfect leader? Most of us. Most people look and feel nothing like that picture-perfect CEO. And so we're tempted to count ourselves out because that picture doesn't remind us of ourselves. We assume we're not cut out for leadership. Yet, facts tell you, when you look at real CEOs, 70% of them didn't set their sights at the top job until they were within the earshot, until decades into their careers and experiences. So when it, when it comes to looking the part and delivering results, those just aren't the same thing. It reminds me of Jay. Jay called me four years ago because he wanted some help navigating relationships with his new investors. And so 
Jay was a force of nature. He was a su successful technology CEO who grew the company from a fledgling startup to being a real dominant player in the industry. So over a three hour lunch, Jay grilled me on our CEO research and how it could potentially help him. Until the very end when the check arrived, Jay very quietly and without looking at me, all of a sudden said, and you know what else? I'm not even sure how far I can take this company without having a college degree. Here was this guy that was delivering outstanding results, torturing himself because he was worried he didn't look the part. Faced with these painful misconceptions over and over and over again, we just couldn't stand it any longer. It was on us to fact check leadership. Coming from a family of mathematicians, when in doubt, I go to data. And data we had. Reams of data, in fact. Over 25 years, our firm has assembled detailed data on over 18,000 leaders. For each of those leaders, we conducted expert, live expert interviews over four to five hours and gathered detailed information about their jobs, their, their patterns of their behavior, their motivations, their results, their wins, successes. In fact, if you were to print out those interview transcripts, the, the paper trail would stretch for 100 miles. It's enough to wrap around Manhattan three times. Truly big data. An ultimate insider look at what it actually takes to succeed. We assembled an extended team of researchers and collaborators to look into that data. It was over 38 people around the world with 10 PhDs, with leading data miners and leading economists at the University of Chicago. And together, we sought to decode what we come to call the CEO genome. What actually leads to high performance at the top? Data showed it plain and clear. What, it take, what looks the part and what it actually takes to deliver performance just aren't the same things. So for example, charismatic extroverts really do look great. And in fact, they are more likely to get selected for many jobs. Yet, when you look at performance, they don't provide any performance advantage. Pedigree looks great. In fact, in our data set, 7% of the CEOs did have Ivy League education. On the other hand, 8% didn't graduate from college at all, and it didn't prevent them from delivering strong results. CEOs may look perfect from afar, but up close and personal, what we found is 45% of them have had huge blow-ups in their careers, and 100% of them made significant mistakes. On the flip side, if you happen to have a strong accent, you're 12 times less likely to get picked for a CEO job, whereas accent has no bearing on performance. As a woman, you're 28% less likely to get a CEO job, while women, our data showed, are just as likely to be successful CEOs as men are. So if what it takes to look the part and what it takes to deliver results aren't the same thing, what actually makes a difference to results? Could we uncover the CEO genome that showed what it actually took to perform? Truthfully, we didn't know. We spent 10 years studying this question. And thanks to cutting edge analytical tools, to our team's tireless efforts, and frankly, to a lot of coffee and a lot of debates, we did uncover four behaviors that are statistically associated with delivering high performance. Think of the word dare, just to help you remember. D a R E, like dare to look beyond what looks good to what actually delivers results. D stands for decisiveness. Highly decisive CEOs must just have this uncanny ability to make the right calls more often than not, right? Wrong. What the data shows, successful CEOs stand out more for their speed of decision making than necessarily the accuracy and precision. It turns out being a CEO is more like being a soccer goalie who can't afford to overthink her next dive, more so than being a brain surgeon where precision and perfection are essential. These highly decisive CEOs were 12 times more likely to succeed. A stands for adaptability. Kodak, Blackberry, Blockbusters, sounds familiar? The gutters of history are filled and littered with companies and people who fail to adapt. And then they're the master adapters, 
those who can just see the future before the rest of us do, who have a more powerful crystal ball, right? Wrong again. What our data showed is that successful CEOs, rather than being the first to see the future, are actually better than the rest of us at letting go of the past. Changing past habits and past business models while they're still comfortable and while they're still effective because they're better ones that will serve them better for the future. To borrow from the boiling frog metaphor, while the rest of us are comforted by the increasingly warm water, these master adapters leap out of the pot and they're seven times more likely to succeed. The next CEO genome behavior really gave us a lot of trouble. Relentless reliability. Reliability as a CEO behavior? Reliability sounds so mundane, it's hard to believe it actually makes a difference. And yet, the data was clear. Arguably, reliability was the most powerful behavior of them all. Highly reliable leaders were twice as likely to get selected for a CEO job and 15 times more likely to succeed. All right, well, so maybe reliability is important, but at least maybe the good news is that it sounds pretty easy, right? After all, most of us try to be responsible and reliable most of the times, right? Well, so to test that out, we designed an online survey on the four CEO behaviors. 12,000 people around the world took the survey. You know what we found? Reliability was the lowest rated behavior. So it turns out reliability is simple, but it's far from being easy. And when you think about it, as a leader, others rely on us for their lives and their livelihoods. And when the stakes are high, being mostly reliable is really not being reliable at all. If you're wondering if you're relentlessly reliable, here's a fascinating thing. When we gather feedback on leaders, if they are relentlessly reliable, it will inevitably show up as one of the first three qualities somebody will mention about them. One of the CEOs will work with Bill. The first thing anyone will say about him is Bill's diabolical follow-through. And people will talk about how this diabolical follow-through both builds deep trust that Bill can really be counted on to deliver and forces others around him to step up their game and be more reliable in turn. Finally, E stands for engaging for results. Looking for from afar, it looks like for CEOs to build followership, to get others to follow them, they must have uncanny gift for charisma and likability, right? Well, in fact, analyzing successful CEOs, they're more fo focused on delivering results than they are on being liked. Far, in fact, from being Miss or Mr. Congeniality, they often will rock the boat and make people uncomfortable for the sake of delivering strong results. Think of the best sports coaches. They use just the right combination of sticks and carrots to push the team to their best performance. All the while, laser focused on getting the team to the podium, getting the team to win, not them winning the popularity contest. Leaders who engage for results are about twice as likely to succeed. There are so many seductive theories about leadership that make leadership sound so alluring, so mysterious, and ultimately so out of reach for most of us, like this exclusive elite club available to very few. And yet, these four behaviors that are statistically associated to strong results sound so deceivingly simple, and yet really hard to practice consistently, and they take years to master. Much like my, my grandmother's question back at the airport, English was by far not the most exciting thing for me to focus on. But the one thing that was sure to make a difference, and the one thing I could actually act on that didn't require any inborn traits or a lot of money, but that did require years and years of relentless efforts to actually get decent at. Remember Jay? Jay was worried about lack of pedigree and relationship with investors. Well, when we looked at the data, what we realized is that the biggest danger facing his company was Jay's lack of reliability. In seemingly benign ways, it jumped at us from behind every single corner. Hazardous. Jay was late to every single meeting, making his, feel, his team feel stuck and disrespected. Jay was reluctant to upgrade his team because he was worried that the pedigreed executives would upstage him or that he couldn't relate to them. And so as a result, he was left closing holes. And Jay's biggest reliability fault of all, he hated saying no. Eager to achieve, eager to please others, and an optimist by nature, Jay took on requests from his board, his customers, his employees, to the point where he and his company were in a constant state of overdrive. 
Imagine Jay's horror when this guy, who more than anything he wanted to deliver for others and he wanted to excel, when he realized that the single biggest hazard facing his company was him. Faced with this data, Jay didn't need to be told twice. Over the next couple of years, we worked together to help him build three key pillars to reliability, to help him evolve his mindset, his habits and behaviors, and his team to build a highly reliable organization. And the good news, he later took his company public and since then has had an unbroken track record of delivering on expectations. No matter how successful, all of us want an edge. And just like Jay, we often are surprised when faced with data, where our biggest gaps are and what it takes to improve. So if you're wondering how to get that edge, ask yourself and others around you, what is the one thing you can do today to be more consistently decisive adaptable, reliable, and engaging for results. And just like my grandmother's simple question 29 years ago, stopped me in my tracks and ultimately accelerated me forward. I hope you will rethink who gets to be a leader and what good leadership looks like, and that you will dare to look beyond the lustrous things that look so good on the surface, and instead focus on the behaviors that sound simple that are really difficult to do, but are sure to help you get great results for yourself and for the people in your life who count on you. Thank you.